you know, in the spring of uh, this year, I was teaching uh, Yehuda Amichai's poem, Diameter of a Bomb. We were still on virtual mode. When one of the students, who is not here, who always switched on his camera throughout the entire COVID semesters, suddenly interrupted the lecture saying, Russia has just invaded Ukraine. Now that may have shaken up the world, but we are so inured to disasters and catastrophes and the necessity of survival that we quickly move on. How many of you, for example, follow what's unfolding in Afghanistan? The war is tipping a fragile world towards mass hunger. It is destroying lives of people far from the battlefield, echoing the line in the Amichai poem, and around these in the larger circle of pain and time. You must have seen desperate citizens in neighboring Sri Lanka. We lose sight of other neighbors, for example, Myanmar, where four pro-democracy activists were executed last week. And over the last year, innumerable people killed and incarcerated. The world was indifferent. Closer home, an unique battlefield has emerged with the state literally bulldozing people's homes. As storytellers, journalists, chroniclers, and documentarians, our job is to inform the world about facts. That is all. Dear students and colleagues, we are delighted to welcome you back and excited by the return of our vibrant campus life. As we continue our journey, we look forward to learning, exploring, and growing together. Throughout the pandemic, you have faced challenges. We appreciate your ability to adapt to modes of working and thinking. This academic year still holds some unknowns for us, but we are all in it together, and like the last two years, we will be understanding of each other. Every year, this day is made special by the presence of people who inspire us to think, question, interpret, feel, and create. I'm honored to welcome Kumar Sahani on stage to deliver this year's JSJC Distinguished Public Lecture on the Future of Cinema. And I'm requesting my colleague Ishan Mukherjee to introduce the speaker. Hi, friends and colleagues. Uh, so uh, let me welcome you all to a new semester. And this semester, we begin a new program at JSJC called a BA Honours in Journalism and, uh, sorry, in Film and New Media. And this event marks the inauguration in some ways of the new program. And we have with us a most distinguished director, uh, Kumar Shahani. Now, uh, I have, uh, I had warned that I'm not qualified to comment on Kumar Shahani's cinema, and I should not be the one introducing. But then, uh, you know, uh, I was asked to do so nonetheless, and I am actually quite daunted by the fact that I've been given 15 minutes to talk about him. Now, the task has been made slightly easier by the fact that I have known Kumar personally before, and I will just tell you how I met him for the first time. I think that will be illustrative of uh, his personality and what probably he is going to offer to us uh, this afternoon. So um, I am actually friends with uh, his daughter, Uttara. You know, Uttara and I were students in Cambridge together. Uh, though uh, I had never met Kumar in the UK, uh, he had come a couple of times. And uh, all I knew was Uttara's father was the ce celebrated filmmaker, Uttara Sh uh, Kumar Shahani. Uh, and I have no shame in admitting that at that time I wasn't particularly familiar with his Uber either. I had seen not too many of his films by then. But it was actually in 2018 when I was working in Bombay that Uttara happened to visit Bombay. And, he, and she called me up saying that, oh, why don't we have dinner together? 
I said, yes, that's a lovely idea. So that evening, we decided to meet for dinner. Now, uh, in about two hours' time, she called me up, rang me up for a second time, and said, you know what, my father is in town, would you mind if he joins us? Now, I said, instinctively, I said, of course. But it was only later that I realized that this meant that I'm going to have dinner with Kumar Shahani. Now, that wasn't, uh, no, uh, you know, a very comforting thought initially. So I quickly Googled and saw what I could read up about him. Uh, and when I did that, I realized that there were at least four to five full length monographs on him and his work. And the time was just too short, right? I had about two hours to read five books. Now that was impossible. So I did exactly what our students do you know, when they are faced with a tight deadline and just too many readings to do, which is to fall back on Wikipedia. So I read Wikipedia, the article on him, and I, I, I went to South Bombay, uh, you know, armed with Wikipedia knowledge to confront Kumar Shahani. Uh, oh, in the meantime, I had messaged Uttara saying that, uh, I hope your father is not going to quiz me about cinema because I know nothing. Uttara said, you quiz him about cinema. So I was kind of reassured that, OK, she will be on my side. Um, so when I entered, of course, uh, he was there, and so was Uttara. And initially, I was nervous. But within you know, five minutes, I was absolutely at rest, enjoying myself, and having a lovely conversation about cinema right, with Kumar Shahani. Uh, we discussed many very interesting things about his early uh, days in FTII as a student of Rithik Ghatak, then his travels to France, uh, his, uh, you know, his interactions with Bresson, uh, and this was the year 1968 in Paris, right? Not only Paris, but the whole world was in turmoil. There was a youth movement going on everywhere, and, and many of you know that, I, I suppose. So Paris was, you know, up in flames, so was you know, the next year, 1969, you have the Woodstock Festival in the US. In India, you have Naxalbadi, right? So that is the moment when he, uh, when he was making films in, in Paris. And in fact, when he came back, uh, he had long hair at the airport. And the airport, uh, airport authorities weren't particularly pleased, I was told. Uh, so, uh, and, and also his interaction with, with Satyajit Ray, which was a bit of a love-hate relationship, I understand. So we discussed all this over lunch, <laughs> and at the end of it, I was, uh, you know, I wasn't feeling too dumb. So this is Kumar Shahani for you, and I invite uh, Mr. Shahani to come and present his distinguished. Apparently there was some exchange between my daughter and him a couple of days ago, where he informed her that I'm coming to this university and her very terse and very usual kind of reply was, oh dear, you know, and that's where it ended. Uh, anyway, uh, uh, thanks for inviting me here and uh, I really want to wish you uh, all the very best for your initiative vis-a-vis, uh, -vis, you can hear me? Yeah. Vis-a-vis uh, -vis your initiative uh, that will bring cinema to a certain level of understanding and a certain level of attention that otherwise many of the private universities, I'm afraid, are unable to, unable to give. Um, in fact, um, even universities, I've taught at many universities abroad. Uh, there are very few universities in the world that are at the moment giving it the kind of attention that it used to receive earlier the aesthetics of cinema, because of the technological changes that have taken place, and because 
the new societies that are emerging uh, are kind of uh, so linked to the fetishization of human beings and commodities that they are not able to look at the reality around and interpret it in an imaginative way. Instead of looking at the cinema, most of the people now are not even looking at what they are looking at, you know, because there is a kind of addictive thing to the digital signal which reaches us. So you may be looking at something, you may be imagining that you're looking at something, but very soon you begin to realize that you're looking at images, yes, but they do not count for any content, you know. Um, and I had read, read some sociological uh, and other um, kind of um, analyses saying that this was happening. But since I never watched television too much, I wasn't experiencing it before. Uh, and it was once when I was traveling with my younger daughter called Revati, who is an artist um, now. I was traveling with her in Europe. And uh, once we were in a hotel room or something, and she started watching television. And I saw that she couldn't, she wouldn't watch anything that we were looking at. For instance, there was something on the war, whichever war was going on at that time, you know, like um, something was happening on the Kashmir border, now I remember, you know. And I wanted to know more about what was going on. Uh, and she wouldn't have much patience with it. She'd switch it to something else, something to do with animal, animals, you know, roaming about in the, uh, you know, on the Discovery Channel or something. And she wouldn't stop at any time. So she, I said, to Rebu, don't you, don't you want to, don't you want to know what is what you're looking at? She said, all right, since you insist that I stay on a, you know, visual attack. You try it yourself. And I did. And I, I thought immediately that she was right, because the kind of attention that anything uh, needs, like the kind of films that I make, I demand attention, you know. The kind of uh, films that Bresson made, you know, they, they demanded attention. So did Ritik Das films, who were my gurus. Uh, so did uh, Eisenstein's films and Griffith's films, um, who were the gurus of Ritik Da and Shotajit Rai and so on. So actually, it is our nervous system itself which is being challenged by the new technologies. And we have to be very, very careful uh, in how we deal with them. Um, two of my brothers were neuroscientists. One of them is still alive. He's retired. And I myself wanted to institute um, a school of advanced studies in Kerala, for which we did get some support, including the land which was taken back, however, uh, which uh, would have uh, provided us with op opportunities of inviting the best minds along around uh, performing arts, cinema, uh, and um, sculpture, music and the nervous system, the neurophysiological response 
And uh, I think what we do need to see is what we are being told very deceptively again and again about the change in technologies. So something marvelous happened, as you all know, I'm sure, uh, in imaging just a few days ago, a couple of weeks ago, probably. That is the Webb telescope. And uh, I think it's going to change our ways of looking at things. And not only that, but our ways of speaking about things. They've already started speaking about things differently. The, the, the claim is that they are taking us to the beginning of time, as it were, to the Big Bang, and that we will actually see that. You know? But there is this wonderful little article. I, I of course, doubted it from the beginning, but I was also taken by it. I was attracted by that idea. Uh, you know th that one can go back in time through the infrared uh, band, that is the non-visible band which becomes the visible band through infrared photography. It was used generally for policing. So people would go within a couple of hours of some incident taking place, wherever it might have happened, a murder or assassination or something like that, a rape, and they would go to that site and through the heat that was present, they would convert the infrared spectrum to the spectrum which is visible, that of the rainbow and so on. Now, but here the claim is much greater. That is, they are going to the beginning of time. So people that I have spoken to, who are slightly more scientific-minded than I am, uh, have told me this is not credible. Because uh, as far as I remember uh, reading about different forms of energy and knowing about conversions of one form of energy to another, this seems almost a fanciful thought. So um, Uttara's mother, because I keep in touch with her on the phone and email, uh, sent me something which I want to share with you, uh, which she got from her art review. Um, this is the web, it's entitled The Web Telescope Shows the Universe as we hope to see it. So the irony is there that it shows something as we hope to see it. Incidentally, this uh, kind of uh, uh, collapsing of time and um, our usage of it is very ancient. Uh, that, uh, I mean, every time you say a prayer, for example, or you express a desire or a wish, we used to be able to use uh, what uh, the Europeans call the subjunctive mood. So you say, I wish that we were all together in this adventure. Now, you will notice in such a sentence that uh, I use the present tense, but I go back to the past tense. I, I wish that we were able to do something. And actually, we are talking about the future. You know? So this has also created, um, in the last uh, 30 years, this usage of the subjunctive mood, which was very essential to the European languages, and I think even more essential to any society which believed that they could somehow express their desire, their wish, their prayer, etc. So which includes almost all civilizations. Uh, 
But in the last 30 to 40 years, the subjunctive has been almost banned from the media. You know, so while subtitling one of my films, which was very, very uh, dependent on that, because it's called Khayal Gatha. So Khayal, you know, has to deal with mental space and mental time, and uh, obviously with the past, present, and future. So the entire film is aspirational in, a, in its mode. And uh, I was told by the people who bought the film that in my subtitles, I should not use the sub subjunctive. And I lost a lot of money and time because I said no to that. You know. uh, however, finally they accepted, after 10 years or something, that I may use the subjunctive when they showed the film. But more recently, I met Bresson's wife uh, after some 40 or 50 years, and she said with great pain that the subjunctive is not being allowed, you know. And then I talked to several linguisticians, uh, and they said, yes, indeed, the subjunctive is disappearing any, anyway from the language. So I think now it is our function to look at anything which deprives us of the modes of address that we have inherited from our classical civilizations right up to today. And it will be the function of the cinema and other, other activities related to it, like you mentioned the trending activities now are gaming, etc. Um, because they all will have to do with the past, present, and future. It can't, you can't, uh, you know, you can't be doing gaming without that idea, you know. So that technology has to be understood in such a way that you develop an aesthetic which widens our scope for thought, and our scope for thought, our scope for desire our scope for uh, even the experience of the, which we call cosmic or divine or whatever else you want. So in this context, she sent me this very, uh, that is Uttara's mother, uh, sent me this thing and I, I, I'll pass it on to you, the, you, but you must have seen these kind of images on all the, you know, reports that are coming out of, um, of this. Now, one of the things that is very clear is that these images are actually doctored. You know, they are not as uh, like the photographic images that you have, for example, of the birds around here that Satpal has taken, he told me, and uh, they are very fine images in their detail. Now, this article opens with uh, a line saying, there's a whole process of subjective choice and aesthetic messaging that shapes the way we see the furthest points of deep space. You know, and my, uh, my, dialogue with uh, Manikta, Shatijit Rai, was very much, even before this telescope or digital, before the digital came into being, was that, that when you place the camera, you're making a choice, you know. And the choice cannot be that you're just providing us with the illusion of reality. There is many, much more that goes into it. And of course, he, he couldn't say no to that. But nevertheless, the idea was to keep cinema 
as something transparent, transparently giving you the coordinates for reality, you know, or experiencing it. Whereas the attempt by Ritikda, for example, or by Bresson, who were teachers of mine by choice, not, they were not imposed on me, you know, um, would, would actually emphasize that the, the, the choice is bringing to it your viewpoint at that particular time, and the shot should be, um, every fragment should be clearly stated as containing some of the subjecti subjectivity of the observer, you know. So, no matter which way things swing, there is always the subjectivity that we have to examine. And I cannot even treat, for example, an object as being purely something of an object. That a, a number of subjectivities have created this object. And a number of subjectivities are going to interact with me when I use this object. So when it comes to, for instance, in, uh, when one is taking a shot, let us say, with any one of you, a human being, or even a leaf uh, swaying in the wind, one has to respect the subjectivity of that. You know? So the, very broadly speaking, those were the parameters of the love-hate relationship that I had, as you said, with Manik Da. Um, so, uh, I would uh, recommend that you go to this article. I won't read any more from this. It's available on. Um, but you know, uh, it's not only that it is uh, that they are coloring in according to a completely arbitrary choice. Uh, it is uh, the other claims that are being made, like the number of grays that are there in a pixel, and the kind of layering that might, that might involve is something that we all have to work on before we take any de definite position on this kind of imaging, you know, or any imaging for that matter, uh, of the future. So the future of cinema faces many, many challenges. Uh, and the greatest challenge is, in fact, through two or three very important factors. One is the um, very quick uh, superficial changes which are being made in the technology uh, so that um, at one time, for example, Francis Ford Coppola, who made The Godfather some years ago, said uh, that wherever he talks to people about the future of cinema, they quote the film Avatar. So probably it lies in animation. Yesterday we were talking about something, uh, and Kishore said, you know, there's, what are those three or four things that uh, you mentioned? Animation, visual effects. Visual effects. Gaming and comics. Gaming and comics. Uh, the graphic novel, for example, as well. So, uh, in fact, I met a person in China and he was circling me for a while, and I, I didn't know, and he was an Italian, you know. So I just wondered, so I said, but I went up to him and I said, uh, is there something you want to talk to me about? So he said, yes, I met you in Italy, and um, you were presenting a film there or so, something like that. And uh, then I'm a graphic novelist, but I thought I'll switch to cinema, and he's had a very bad experience. 
you know, because uh, he felt that he had more control over what he wanted to say in the graphic novel. So he asked me what is the way to work out things so that he is independent. Now I've always worked as an independent filmmaker and as a result I've had great problems raising funds and working with institutions who have made up their minds about the content of the film before looking at the content itself, you know? So uh, it's been a difficult time, let's say, for any independent filmmaker, not only me. And it has now reached a kind of uh, crisis. So what will it mean for the future? I dread to think about it. Uh, the situation is really fascistic because those who are funding cinema are now more anonymous. They are corporate bodies. You can't discuss anything with them. They have one single goal, which is to make profit. And uh, the independent filmmakers are pushed to a wall. So one of them, who's a very fine independent filmmaker, one of the very few, uh, is a woman called Tasita Dean, who now lives in three cities. And she has to have to, she has to, poor thing, has to live in three cities to be constantly on the run, as it were, both trying to raise money, and to show her work. She lives in um, LA, London, and Berlin. And she had also come to that conference, which was held by um, Shivendra Dungarpur, uh, who is trying to build up uh, an archive in India, which will be free. I mean, which will be uh, free of pressures of, from the state. So it will be probably the first genuine film archive here. And you know, the history of the archive itself is that of resistance to fascism. I knew the people who pioneered in it. That is Longlua, Mierson, Madame Mierson, and um, Lotte Eisner. Lotte Eisner was actually German, a uh, Jew probably, herself. And it is thanks to her uh, that we are able to see today Charlie Chaplin's film, The Great Dictator. It's entirely thanks to her, because had she not retrieved it from a some dungeon where it was hidden, uh, we would not have been able to see it. So I would plead with you, like there are many American universities, for example, who have archives of their own. You know. So it is uh, not only to you, but other private bodies that at least there, you can begin to invest money that it will be something uh, which you will be doing for the young and the generations to follow. Um, you know, uh, in such a way as to keep them politically aware and culturally aware. In fact, Shivendra's, uh, Shivendra's uh, archive is called the Film Heritage Foundation. So he's thinking of it as heritage. But you can do more since from what I heard you speak just now about the war, you know, uh, which is present at present going on, 
the archive, if you have an archive, will help future generations to know what was going on at this time and what praxis can emerge from it, what kind of practice can emerge. And this praxis is not just a question of raising slogans and, you know, because it'll be with university uh, knowledge, you know, which a university gives you, you know. Uh, he mentioned to you that I was in Paris in 1968, which was a very, very great time around the world for students. It was, uh, I remember we asked all the politicians to march at the end of the demonstration. They were not allowed, not one of them, including the future president, Francois Mitterrand, you know. Because they all wanted to be in the leadership. He said, we don't want your leadership, you know. None of them, from extreme left to extreme right, they, were, they all marched at the end, you know. The gold, of course, ran away to Germany at that time. We did not know that, but later I read in Le Monde itself that he did run away to Germany. And over there, one of the students was, who was very much in the initiative um, of things was called Daniel Con Bendit. And he was, um, he was often interviewed by Jean-Paul Sartre and the likes of that. And the goal, on the other hand, had called him uh, a German Jew. So we had gone out on the streets and said, we are all German Jews, aren't we? And whatever you do now is that whether it's gaming or animation or some, some new form which uh, develops from the new technologies, do examine it from a point of view of self-determination, you know, which is, which is not only political. Self-determination has very many other kind of uh, things to achieve. Uh, in fact, my last um, fiction film was called Charadhyay. And it is from the novel, uh, probably the last novel, wasn't it, Sandeep, of uh, Tagore's, Rabindranath Tagore's. It's a very abstract novel around a love story. And it was a very controversial thing, which every different kind of politician used against Tagore, finally, you know. Because it's as much about self-determination as it is about um, independence, which is purely political, you know. So naturally, the, he, the dialectics of self-determination are fully explored in that novel, you know and the dialectics of um, what meaning, word, and image constitute. It was the time also where great things were happening in that area. What is, what is the kind of uh, relationship between word and image, for example, and in his own life, he started painting at that time when he wrote that novel. And his words would uh, go through squeal, squiggles, which would end up in a form, you know. So physically, mentally, and otherwise, this was a, a revolutionary novel, you know. But that of a very enriched individual. So there again, there's a dialectic, you know. Normally, you don't associate revolution with individual development. But that was what was happening in Charadhyaya, and I hope that someday you, you will see it uh, 
in this state. Uh, Sandeep had helped me greatly while we were, Sa Sandeep, who you will have the privilege of um, probably learning from if he finds the time and uh, is given the right kind of uh, right kind of atmosphere. I'm, I, I'm hopeful that he will come and teach here. He's one of the best in the world. And I can tell you that um, through all my experience in Australia, America, Soviet Union, um, and other parts of Europe, that I've seen people teach. And he combines uh, within himself the uh, uh, you know, the system which we employed, like with a class in the manner of Oxford and Cambridge and so on, uh, but also he includes within it the relationship that the guru has with his shishya. So the, the guru shishya parampara is combined in a sense in the way uh, that artists need, you know, in, in, even in our modern modes of teaching, the contemporary modes of teaching, which are largely governed by our colonial experience. Yeah. So when the next th round of, round of uh, economic changes take place, but they have to take place. This system cannot survive with only, f according to Piketty, only 5% of the people or corporates own 95% of the resources that the world has to offer. So I, I do not think it's a viable system. I don't think it can last too long. And uh, even Chomsky is saying that, you know, who normally does uh, put the market above everything. You know, even he is saying that, in fact, he's saying that it's only 1% at the moment. So I don't think such a system can survive. And Therefore, the, you, the young people who are here, have this tremendous act to perform, both individually and together, as a collective. That of swimming through the, all this noise and deception and creating the future. Because there's everything trying to stop that future from being created. And I really, from the bottom of my heart, I'm in total consonance with your, with your aspirations. Today, when I heard one of the young people say that she dances all by herself, I was very moved. And that's, that's how it should be. that uh, I brought up my two daughters, and they used to, like Uttara told me when she was just six or seven years old, after reading a comic book or something, that she wants to be like the Buddha. And she was only six or seven years old. And she used to devour all kinds of literature, you know, including, uh, Isaac Deutscher on Stalin or something like that, you know? So um, I didn't stop her. A lot of people said that what you're doing is wrong. And I didn't stop her. I didn't stop any of, we used to receive guests from any part of India and the world. And I used to encourage them to speak to her or recite to her nursery rhymes or things in their own language, even if it were Finnish or Hungarian. And, and I think it equipped her very well, you know. Um, once uh, she was in 
we were in Italy together, and she uh, she was uh, introduced to a little child, while I had to go on writing. I was interviewing the granddaughter. Uh, yeah, I was in, in interviewing the daughter and granddaughter of uh, somebody called Wilfred Bion, who was a very great psychoanalyst, born in India. But Uttarad knew only Marathi herself, to speak Marathi, and that other girl knew only Italian. And they had a great time conversing with one another, you know, for over an hour and a half while I was doing this little bit of work. So it is with the same faith that I would like you to approach the future of cinema. You know, don't say I don't understand to any culture, to any articulation, to any language. Wait for the meaning to emerge, you know. That's how you will create whatever it is you want to create. The meaning emerges, it's not given. It's, it doesn't precede the act. Unfortunately, uh, that's not the way financiers, corporates, even individuals behave towards you, you know. They say you give us a script. Now, uh, it's, it's become really a joke because people who can't read, many of the people in the film industry and in communication industry don't read. They don't have the time to read. They've never had it, you know. They're always deceiving other people. Some actors even say, and quite rightly, those who, quite honestly, the best actors have told me that um, what performance does to them is that um, you evoke something best when you claim not to understand it, you know? So don't preconceive what the meaning will be. So it's, it's something we must, uh, uh, we must assert again and again. You know? Unless you just want to service a client, that's a different matter. So when you, sometimes you have to service a client. You know, like you, you might be asked to make an advertising film. Obviously, uh, the client will say, I want my soaps to be sold in such and such way. That, and, uh, you know, if the soap is, if their idea is that it's going to make the skin whiter or something like that, you know, you can't be saying that it'll make you a glowing, black, beautiful uh, skin, you know? You'll have to make that advertising film, but you don't, don't have to sign it, you know? You sign, you say, this is the client's work. I've done it as a service. So you may have to do a lot of publicity that way. Propaganda, a lot of people do that. Uh, but if you want to be furthering the language of cinema and your own self-expression, not just your own, it is never just your own self-expression, it is the expression of everybody else that you are addressing. Because in, in the language that you are creating, there is no such thing as a completely objectified think or person. And in our own tradition, I think we reached a magnificent zenith um, in uh, Buddhist art. Because Buddhist art is often so differently detailing a thing. You know, that each thorn, each leaf, each line within a sculpted thing suggests life. 
And when you're taking us in, in cinema, you're imaging from reality, there's life all around, you know. The, it is not only that which is acted, which is life, which has life. And life is, works through transience. It's not fixed in any way, either in meaning or in form. So I think that's the great thing which cinema gifted to us, to the world. When the little machine was invented itself, you know. Uh, some people say that it was invented because they wanted to study the movement of the horse. And of course the Hollywood, Hollywood people invented the genre of uh, the Western mainly because of that. Um, but it does more than that. It can, it can show uh, something in such a marvelous way that the problems of knowledge, which were first posed by people like Buddha or the Upanishads, uh, this film in the morning that was seen by some of the people who are here has a has lot of quotations from the Upanishads, indeed from the Rig Veda. And the quotation from the Rig Veda also talks about the beginning, which is, uh, in darkness was darkness enveloped, you know. So through the cinema, everything is available to you, including that which is likely to be its future. I hope that you will recognize that and carry on. This is just the beginning. That's a, that was a slogan that we used in May 68 or so. Sane qu'un début. Let us continue the assertion, affirmation, love, compassion for life. That's it. <laughs>